Good morning, class. How was your weekend? Hope it was a wonderful one. Hope it was restful. Um, I'd like to start by just welcoming you again to your second class on Intermediate Object Oriented Programming. Um, in this particular class session, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going over a review of chapters 1 to 7. This is material you covered in your previous class, the prerequisite to this particular class. And so, I want to go over this material and make sure you're up to speed with everything you need to know as we move forward in this particular class. Now, what are we going to cover today? What is our agenda? I'd like to start by really just going back to the basics, dealing with what a computer is. A lot of people use computers on a daily basis. A lot of us use computers on an hourly basis, but sometimes we really don't understand what constitutes a computer. So I'd like to go back and touch on that. Well, we're going to look at programs, what they are and what their purpose is. But not only that, we're going to look at the Java programming language uh, specifically. That's what we're going to be working on in this very hands-on class. And then we're even going to delve into the anatomy of a Java program and uh, look at some of the examples of these programs as we move forward. Now, a lot of you are going to ask me, why is this important? As an IS and as an IT major, I anticipate when you graduate, you're expected to get a job in the industry. Working for any company in the industry, you're going to be using a computer and you're going to be developing software in some form, shape, or manner. Or even if you're not developing software, you're going to be using a computer to some extent. This is considered like the tool of your trade. So it is important for you to understand how to wield the sword if you are considered a knight in the round table back in the day. But this is what you're going to be using on a daily basis. It is important to, for you to understand what constitutes a computer and how you can make the best use of the computer you have or whatever system you're working with. So we're going to dive right in. Back to the basics. What is a computer? Now, before we go too fast or too far, I'd like you to take a minute and just pause and picture this scenario with me. You can close your eyes and think about this. Every morning, when you wake up, for a lot of people, it's an alarm clock that wakes you up. It might be your phone, the alarm application on your phone. It wakes you up in the morning, 6 o'clock a.m. maybe. At the very core of that device, that phone you have, is a microchip powering it. That's a mini computer. All right, fast forward. You wake up, then maybe you stumble out of bed, you're still very drowsy. For some of us, we have to head straight to the kitchen and get coffee. So you stumble your way to the kitchen and the coffee maker has automatically brewed a cup of coffee for you, ready to go. How did it know to brew the coffee when you would be waking up? Well, you would have previously set the coffee maker to brew coffee maybe for 6 o'clock or for 5.30. But it's possible it can execute instructions automatically because it has a microchip. It has a computer powering it. Fast forward. You're done with your morning coffee. You're ready. You're leaving for work. You step out of the door. You get into your car. And you hit the highway. In that car is a number of different computers powering the different systems. Recently in the news, the Jeep Cherokee, I think that's what it is, the latest one, uh, I think it's the 2016 version that just came out, that car was actually hacked. They demonstrated how attackers can take control of the car while the user is still inside the car and disable all of the functions of the car from the user and the attackers in the video uh, I watched actually took control of the car and drove it off the highway. Why is that possible? It's possible because that car has computers that are controlling it, computers that are running its systems. So apart from your desktop computers, which we're very familiar with, your laptop computers, which you know we're also familiar with, and then now you have your iPads and all these other devices, Computers are being miniaturized. You have computers in your phones, you have computers even in your smart watches now. It is amazing what 
computers can do. So why is it important? It is important to understand computers because we work with them every day. We deal with them every day. Now, going back to the lecture, what consists a computer? There are a couple of things. I'd like to outline three main things for you to remember. If you remember nothing in this lecture, these three main things constitute a computer. A CPU, a memory, and a hard disk. Or I'll break it down to you. Central processing unit, which is like the brain of the computer where all the computation takes place. You have a memory, which is a temporal storage, a volatile kind of storage. And you also have a hard disk, which is a permanent storage. There are other peripheral devices like a monitor, a printer, a communication devices, or even your USB, your USB drives you plug into your computer. These are peripheral devices. Okay, but these are the main three things that constitute any computer you would know. Usually you would have a bus, which is a communication line that connects all the different components in a computer. So going right into the CPU, central processing unit. Remember that CPU stands for central processing unit. This is the brain of the computer. This is where all the calculations take place. How does it do it? It gets instructions from the memory. Instructions are loaded into the memory and the CPU or the central processing unit uses these instructions for computation. Okay? Now, when you're buying a computer, <clears throat> when you're buying your phone, when you're buying any device, what you want to know, the main thing you're always looking for is how fast is this device? What is the clock speed? It's usually measured in megahertz. Nowadays, gigahertz, your average computer here on campus, maybe in the computer lab, is going to be about three to four gigahertz. Um, a lot of the computers, a lot of the basic systems that measure in megahertz, the implication or the meaning of that is simply one million pulses per second, or in other words, one million instructions, computational instructions. Uh, this might seem a little too complex or a little too powerful, but remember, at the very basic level, all a computer is doing is just adding. That's why in the matrix, when you looked at the screen, they had ones and zeros. At the very basic level, that's what a computer is just doing, is adding ones and zeros. Again, that's the CPU, the brain of the computer, where computation takes place. The next thing we want to look at is the memory. The memory is where instructions or program is stored for the CPU to execute them. Now, usually what is going to happen is you would have a permanent storage which is going to keep your program or your data or your instructions and that permanent storage, usually known as a hard drive, would load the instructions into the memory and the memory executes them. Now, you have to understand that memory is volatile. If you unplug the power, you lose the information in memory. That is why you need a permanent storage device to handle whatever data or whatever instructions you have. So memory is also commonly referred to as the RAM. I know you've probably heard about that. That's what you have, You again, you look at one of the things you look at when you're buying a computer or your phone. Why is the RAM important? The more memory or the more RAM you have in your computer, the more instructions, the more programs you can run at the same time, the more things you can load into your memory and actually run at the same time. So your computer gives you the illusion of parallel processing. Some computers do that very well, others don't do. But if they have enough memory, they could give you an illusion or simulate parallel processing, which is just running multiple programs at the same time. More memory is good, remember that. Now, let's look at the motherboard. The motherboard is like the chassis of the computer, it's like the foundation. When you look at a car, a car has a metal frame. For those who have tinkered with cars, you, a car has a metal frame that carries every other thing. It's called the chassis, okay? It's like the foundation of the car. That's what the motherboard is to the computer. You see here, the motherboard houses the CPU, the brain of the computer. It houses the RAM, the memory of the computer, tem temporal memory, and also the ROM. The ROM is also another aspect of the memory. We're going to get into that uh, a little more in our next lecture. But you also have extension slots over here where you can, uh, you could use sound cards, you can use video cards, you can use other uh, devices you want. So this is the motherboard. This is like the foundation of the computer. So storage devices. Again, 
I said memory is volatile. When you power off the computer, your information can be lost. If you didn't store the information, if you didn't write it to the hard disk, if you, hit, if you didn't hit control S or save, your information will be lost. So what happens? Why do we need a storage device, permanent storage device? The programs and the data are stored in these devices. And what happens when you open up a program or open up an application is that information, the program's data, as well as the instructions for that program, gets loaded into the computer to run by the CPU. Okay? So this is where we're going to stop for today. This is where we're going to round up for today. If there's anything I want you to take away from this lecture is you have to remember these three things. The three basic things that constitute a computer, three basic things that make up a computer. The first one is your CPU, central processing unit. That is the brain of your computer, okay? That's what does all the computations, that's what does all the calculations on the computer. Second thing is memory. Remember, memory is volatile. Memory is your temporal storage. You need it because computer programs or instructions for those programs need to be stored there on the fly before they're executed by the CPU. And you have permanent storage, which is usually your hard disk, your disk drive, CD drive, or anything that can hold information on the long run over a long period of time without needing power. That is going to be usually a permanent storage device, usually referred to as a permanent storage device. So I hope you've learned something today. I hope you've taken away something from this class. As you go home, I want you to just think on this. So you step out of this door, think about all the computers you can identify. The vending machine you see outside, it has a computer. The printing terminal you see as you're walking through the hallway, it has a microchip. It's powered by a computer. We are surrounded by computers. You have a good understanding of computers. You know how to work with them. You're going to excel in your, in your, in your trade. You're going to excel. It's going to make you more competitive. It's going to make you more marketable. And it's going to make you more appealing to that job you're trying to get. So have a good week. And uh, we'll see you back here next class. And uh, if you have time, watch the video on the hacking of the Jeep Cherokee. And we'll start our next class with that. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.